Hey everybody, my name is Al Nicoletti. I'm an attorney here in Florida and welcome to the Al Nicoletti Show where I bring on real estate super investors, rising rock stars, movers and shakers, and leaders of clubs in their community that educate, entertain, and inspire all things Florida real estate on how you can take your company to the next level. I have on my show today, Victor Juracek. He is this big flipper guy. He's a big flipping deal when it comes to flipping houses. And he is in the small market of Gainesville, the Alachua County area in Florida, which is so unique, such a unique perspective. And I just remember seeing him post on Facebook. He's got all these flips. He's got this thing going on, that thing going on. And so he's got a lot of things going on with flipping properties. And we're going to talk about that today because when we were going through all the things he wanted to talk about, it was flipping, flipping, and flipping. So we will cover that in the show today. And I want to introduce you to Victor Juracek. Victor, welcome to my show. Well, I appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Thanks for oh. the nice introduction too. And you got my name right. So that's, that <laughs> doesn't always happen. <laughs> hey, like I said, we, we have to go backstage. We, we get everything together. And I'm so happy you're here today because like I said, I've seen you on Facebook. You're posting all the stuff. You have your mentorship program, which we'll dive into because that is super valuable for any new investors or maybe seasoned investors that were just investors, but now want to take it to a new level of innovating and creating and doing their own flips in their homes. But before we dive into all of that, Victor, talk to us about who Victor is. Like, where did this all start before real estate? How did you get into real estate? And now that you're in it or you did your first deal, where are you today and how did you get here? Oh, absolutely. Happy to dive into my journey here. Uh, so I started out, so luckily real estate's been a family business. So I got started young. So we were back in Utah with the family working on deals. And back then I was 14 and I'd help out on a property on the weekend after school. And back then I was just helping like renovate the property, like basic stuff, manual labor, like, Hey, rip out this carpet, take out these, you know, demo this, take care of that. Might earn maybe 20 bucks for the entire weekend, you know, working as much as I could. Wow. And back then I was happy. It was like 14, 20 bucks. This is awesome. <laughs> so got started there since it was partially a family business. As I grew older, I wanted to do my own thing. So I tried to depart from it. And tried a ton of stuff, tried like home services, healthcare, tried like online businesses, and eventually found my passion being again, real estate, like slowly got back into like, I like this, it's lucrative, I can really help people and just slowly got back into real estate. And then slowly moved here to Gainesville, Florida and been doing flips. I've tried a ton of stuff. I've tried Airbnb, I've tried rentals, I've tried flips, I've tried wholesaling, just really like the flips. There's a lot of elegance in a flip. Yeah, there's a before, it's a crummy property that needs work. There's an after, it's really nice. You close, big check in hand, move on, and you can start, you know, start doing more of those. So I really like the flips. Um, on track for, it's, it's 2020, so 20 flips this year. And very happy about that and want to do even more next year. And I'm just really honing in on what I do. And I think the other thing we'll definitely dive into as well is I do everything locally. So I don't do flips in Arkansas, Alaska. I do everything Gainesville, Alachua County, local, small town, small town. And that's, that's the story there. But that's how I got started. And I love that. That's why I have you on here because it's, you're really focusing on the Florida market, Florida industry, and you're in your small county. And, and that's really interesting. You tried the Airbnb. You tried all the other things. I even think I saw a post recently, and correct me if I'm wrong, you're done with like all the tenants and dealing with that kind of sure. stuff. I saw that story. That may be a good story if you want to share it. But basically, you tried all of those things and you found flipping and the, the act of making something that was just dilapidated, the roof coming in or the grass, you know, all over the place, you're, you're creating something that is, is you. It's almost like art in a way, isn't it? Well, that's a good way to put it. I've never thought of it that way, but there's the design element, you know, there's making a house nice and pretty. And to touch on your earlier point, there's nothing wrong with rentals, nothing wrong with the Airbnb strategy, just for me and my personality and what I like to do. I just really honed in on the flips. So I just really like to do that. And there really is like you, whenever you fix up a property, you definitely leave your own thumbprint on it. Like you leave your own impression on the property, choosing colors, choosing the type of flooring, choosing the type of bathrooms, you know, choosing the, the fixtures. So you definitely leave your like a little piece of you in each property every, every time you do any sort of renovation. 
Right. So uh, like I'm not in tune with all the flipping. I don't do flipping. I don't do investing. I don't do any of that stuff. So what is your style when it comes to this stuff? Like what are you, what kind of art are you trying to design? Is it like, you know, sometimes you pick up on the same kind of style clothes. You pick up on the same style. I want that car because it's a coupe. Mm -hmm. I want this. Like what, what are you seeing from your artistic mind of building the flip that you are putting that signature print? What's the Victor signature? Here we go. Yeah. So what we do, and we like to repeat the patterns If something works and it's in style and we like to repeat it over and over. So if you see a lot of my houses and see my posts, a lot of them look similar and that's, that's on purpose. So we go for a lot of the modern look. So it's typically like gray walls, white trim type of look like new finishes. If it's a higher end home, those stainless steel appliances. So kind of that new modern look is what we typically do. People really like that. And the other thing we do, instead of doing like carpet in the bedrooms, so we do the same, like a, a laminate flooring or like an LVP all throughout the entire house. Uh, we've seen like a lot of people are coming to the realization that they don't want carpet in their house. You know, you make spills on it. It doesn't last that long. It's, you know, you got to replace it more often. So a lot of people don't like that. So we do the same flooring all throughout and it makes it look bigger. It makes it look, you know, there's less spills. Uh, especially with pets too. That's the other thing. Pets can ruin carpet pretty quickly. Uh, so they like the, it's not a hardwood, but it's like a harder surface all throughout. Uh, so that's pretty much what we do. It's just more of that modern look, same flooring all throughout. Um, just try to make it look nice. It's, it's the biggest thing. Just make it look nice. So it has that wow factor. It pops as soon as you walk in. Oh, I agree with you with the carpet. I've had German <laughs> shepherds the whole, my whole life and I've seen what pets can do to carpet. I think there was one point when we picked the carpet off, off the floor and you can just tell it was not the same feel it had, you know, previously. And it's, it's interesting. I think apartment complexes, I think, uh, yeah, flippers all around, even Jacksonville, they're starting to really use like that floor, not that wood look, but it's not really wood, but it's got that, like just a modern feel to it, like you're describing. And that's really interesting. It, it freshens things up. It keeps it, it keeps it nice. So now that you're doing this, now you have a perspective of your, your seasoned flipper. For those that are kind of interested in doing it, like what you're doing, and everybody's got a different mind to it, how do people get started in getting into this? Like, how did it start for you specifically? And then the advice now that you can look back and say hindsight's 2020, what, what, how do you get started on this stuff? For sure. I think. A lot of beginners especially get tripped up on a lot of the little details like, oh, I need to set up an LLC or, oh, I, you know, how do I get funding? I think the, the biggest thing, it's like the number one thing really is getting the deal. So if you get a great deal, everything else will follow. Like if you get a great deal for pennies on the dollar, like you will find funding. The, the LLC sub, that's kind of a secondary thing. But the biggest thing is, you know, getting a home run deal. So a lot of people focus on the wrong stuff. And then this is another one I've heard recently, like, oh, should I get my uh, realtor's license? Should I get my realtor's license first? And then I can start flipping. And there's nothing wrong with getting the realtor license. I just wouldn't, I don't have mine, if that's any indication. But I would also say, like, it's not, it's just not necessary. It's not step one. I'd say step one, like, learn how to find fantastic deals. Like, learn how to negotiate, learn how to market, learn how to get those sales skills down pat. Everything else is going to, you know, put into place. And that's how I started. I started really bad credit score. I think I was low 500s. Didn't have a lot of money, almost zero, a lot of debt, personal debt. And I found a great deal. And based on that, put together like a partnership, I found like a money partner. They put in the funds. I found the deal. I helped with the renovation. I helped like manage it to getting it sold. And then we split the net profit. So me, I was able to get a deal, bad credit, no money, but I had a great deal. I had a great deal. And because of that, I was able to get started. So that's why I recommend for people starting out, like let's, let's really hone in on getting a great deal. The rest is going to fall into place. Yeah. And I'll, I'll point out, like, I think you posted about this, like just the other day mm -hmm. and Hey, I'm paying attention. I'm seeing what's going on out there. And for those that are listening, watching, or seeing the content, find Victor on his Facebook page. And he, he has some really interesting posts that he has and he shares his journey as he goes along. And I saw the post about the credit score and how you were like, you know, I hear people saying this all the time, your credit score, you know, it find the deal and the funding will, will flow from there. Right. Mm -hmm. Is that, that, that's what it that's is. It. I mean, it's about getting the deals. It's hard to get the deals. Right. 
Exactly. Exactly. So if you can get a good deal, it'll, it'll happen for you, you know? So now that people get started and let's say everybody's now diving in, they saw Victor Juracek on, on the show and they're like, how, you know, you know, what are the basics? How do we start with all of this stuff? You know, is it, is it just finding the right supplies, the materials? Because we, we know Gary Booth Jr. here in Jacksonville, love Gary. Gary's a flipper in Jacks mm -hmm. and Gary's really smart about the numbers and the suppliers and, and contractors, right? Cause like, if you're the business owner, you have to get the contractors, the subs, and there's so many moving parts and payroll and, you know, admin, but you know, after all of that stuff, putting all of that aside, what are some of those basics that you see with, with flipping houses that people can get started on? Mm -hmm. So with, with regards to renovation and contractors, I really see there's three, three main ways to actually do the renovation, do the work. Uh, so the first is do it yourself. So that's you doing the painting, you doing the floor, like you're, you're in the house actually doing the work. So that's the first model I've seen. I've seen like the managing subcontractors model. So you hire a painter. Okay. They do a good job. You pay them. You hire the flooring person. Okay. They do a good job. You pay them. And then the third model. So that's like more managing subs is the second model. And then the third model is more general contractor. So you hire one guy, he takes care of everything A to Z. He takes care of the flooring, the painting, everything like that. Maybe he has subs, maybe he has a crew, but that's, that's the third model. So before you get into the, any of the specifics, you have to decide like which model are you going with? And there's no right or wrong answer is what I want to say. There's just trade-offs. So if you hire a general contractor, the trade-off is it's going to cost you, it's going to cost you money, but you'll save time. And on the other side of the spectrum, if you do it yourself, it's going to cost you time, but save you money. So before you get into the specifics, of like who to hire, you know, what supplies to get, I recommend like, okay, what, what model are we working with? What model are we specifically going to choose? and work with, and then based on that, you can start making other decisions. It almost seems like if you don't have that many to do, it's better to go the model where you're doing the work and saving the money, right? I mean, mm -hmm. that, I mean, if you're high volume, you need to be like, all right, wait a second. How do we make this more efficiently? I can't, I need to use my time to keep mass producing. But if you have, you know, one or two or three that you could focus on and you can save the money, that's another thing. But as a business owner, because you're not just a flipper and investor, you're just a business owner too. Talk to us about the tricky side to that when hiring the GCs and the subs. And, you know, even, even for work, doesn't matter, law firm, being a dentist or uh, another doctor, you, you, okay. you own an office, you have an office and you have employees. And, you know, some of the hardest times you're dealing with are the employees, not the flip itself. So talk to us about being a business owner and, and how you're running that with these flips. Mm -hmm. I think the, the biggest transition I made mentally over time, because when I started, it was like me doing the work. Just like I mentioned that first flip, like I'd, I'd help out with the painting, I'd help out with the flooring, I'd help out clear the place. And then over time it transitioned like, okay, then I'll, I started to manage the subs. And then I started to manage, you know, the, the painter and then I started to manage the flooring guy. And then just like you said, it got to a point in volume where it's like, I can't keep handling all this. Uh, I need someone to handle the project A to Z. And then I just show up and pay them. Uh, so that transition happened over time. So with regards to people, I think probably my biggest piece of advice, I, I'll go with two pieces of advice there because your success as a business owner is going to be coming down to your, your skill and dealing with people, managing people. Uh, so the first thing I was going to say is, is like, if there's red flags on the person up front, that's not going to go away. Like if, for example, like they're late consistently or they don't do great work consistently. I found out that people don't really change too much over the short term, like within a couple months or a year, they might change over the long term over a decade plus. So if you realize that with hiring somebody, you're just gonna get more of the same. So do you want more of the same if you're gonna keep hiring them or if you're gonna keep using them? And at a certain point you might not tolerate it, you might have higher standards and say, hey, this isn't a good fit, best of luck. Yeah, I mean, it, it's it's usually about the employees and and mm -hmm. finding the right fit for you and finding the right fit for the company because not everybody's gonna match up mm -hmm. perfectly. But you you know you try to find the best you can. How are you doing? So I think you were telling me what was it twenty flips this year, mm -hmm. and that you're hoping to do even more. Are you, are you trying to like double it next year? Are you trying to triple it? Like now that it's December, this will get posted sometimes in 2021. But like, what's the what's the goal for 2021 for you for those flips? 
I'm still trying to decide and I'm still trying to make my own goals. My first year I did two, second year I did eight. This year I'm on track for 20. I want to like scale effectively and scale well. So I'm thinking I'll probably do 30 for next year. I don't want to grow too fast. Uh, a lot of flippers, they make the mistake. They like, they take on too much. Then projects get delayed or they don't have enough operating capital or there's a lot of, it's not just setting a big number and then like, okay, let's do it. There's a lot of like ins and outs with running it day to day. So I'm thinking about 30 is going to be my, my goal for 2021. So it's about two and a half per month. And that's a much, you know, much bigger growth. If I keep growing at that pace, you know, who knows where I'll be in a decade. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's great. I mean, you're just going to keep scaling up, increasing. Does it have a lot to do with supplies too? So the type of granite and the flooring and, 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 and negotiating prices with all of the outlets and stuff. Cause I don't know anything about any of that, but the scaling and getting to that 20 to 30, not just employees and, and having more help and time, but does a lot of it have to do with the supplies? Partly, yes, uh, especially now with Corona. This wasn't a, a problem a year ago where there was a shortage of supplies, but suddenly there is. So before to get new windows in, you know, a couple of days. And now for windows, it's six to eight weeks out to get brand new windows for like specific wow. type, that sort of thing. It's happened a couple of times with appliances too. Cabinets, kitchen cabinets, where it's like, it's typically, you know, same day or next day, you can get kitchen cabinets. And sometimes now it's, you know, a couple of weeks out. So because of Corona and all the, the issues coming in because of that, there is definitely a delay. It's not the, the highest thing on my list of concerns, trying to scale up and do more, but it's definitely on the list where we didn't have to worry about this a while back. So now instead of you know doing brand new windows in a flip, we'll just stick to like the old windows, just adjust the price accordingly and just move on. So that's really how we're thinking about it. Amazing. So it's almost like COVID kind of affected the style or what you're kind of doing with the flips mm -hmm. because of the supplies, right? So it's, yeah. you know, you didn't expect that, I'm sure. Did not. No, that was, well, what's interesting with the Corona thing. So this, this started to hit March, April. And if you told me back then, because of Corona, the market's going to heat up, I would have told you like, you're crazy. There's no way that doesn't even make sense. But that's, that's where we're at. And before, you know, it was still a hot market. Don't get me wrong, even in Gainesville. But now it's, it's even hotter. It's even hotter for sure. But um, and that's because of Corona, low interest rates and all the secondary effects of that. And here we are. Yeah. I mean, that's fascinating because I haven't heard that one yet from like a flipper about, you know, all the supplies and things taking long. Like I've, I've gotten emails from one of the local builders associations has talked about like lumber prices on the rise. And then I got like another blast the other day that lumber pl prices are on the rise again. And, and I'm seeing that the supply market is very limited right now. Like the supply chains are all over the place, probably about all the policies that each one has. So now that how, how has your business changed besides the windows or besides some of the supplies before uh, COVID hit? And then now COVID hit, how have you changed either like uh, marketing wise or just company wise? Are you focusing on a different style flip or is it, is it still the same as it was before? It's just changing up a couple of things. I think it's the same as before, just more of the same, you know, a house is a house, you know, four walls and a roof. So nothing's really changed there. That hasn't gone out of style at least yet. <laughs> uh, I think so with flipping, what's interesting is you're on both sides of the transaction. So I always say that it's the same amount of difficulty with regards to flipping but one side of the transaction, there's, there's buying it, buying the house, and then they're selling the house. So it's the same amount of difficulty. So let's say right now it's hard to buy a house. It's hard to find a good deal, but it's super easy to sell it just because the market's so hot. Right. Very well may flip in the coming years to, to the opposite where it's super easy to buy it, but harder to sell it. So there's always that, that play. There's always that, but it's always the same amount of difficulty. So if it's always going to be, you know, just balancing out is how I see it. Cause you're always, you're buying and selling with the flipping. So when you're doing these deals, are you doing direct to seller? Like when you're doing marketing, is it direct to seller? Or are you also seeing what deals are available wholesale wise from other investors? Like what's, what would you say the percentage is for either or? Because that also depends on the next question about, you know, the marketing styles or mm -hmm. talking to sellers. For sure. So with regards to finding deals for the mass vast majority, I do off market. So I've only done one MLS deal this year. 
and that's the only one I've done this year and nothing against MLS. It's just more competitive. The prices and the numbers don't make as much sense. And that's what I've seen for the rest of the deals. It's been about half sourced on my own cold calling and then half sourced through wholesalers. So I'm definitely happy to dive into that, but it's about 50, 50 sourcing on my own and sourcing through wholesalers. Oh, we'll definitely dive into that because if there are any wholesalers out there that, you know, Hey, Victor is on the list. Hey, I'm looking, I'm looking in this area. There's, there's plenty, even in um, Gainesville, there could be investors all over Florida that are finding deals wholesale wise. And then, you know, they can connect with you. So we can dive in there, but that was very interesting. You talked about your cold calling. So something I ask on the show, like w- your marketing techniques and strategic marketing is very important if you're doing direct to seller. So what techniques have you realized have been the most fruitful for you either before COVID or maybe now it's changed? You know, even I, I interviewed Ron uh, a couple days ago and I was like, Ron, what marketing tech techniques are you up to? And social media has been big and all of this stuff. I thought he was going to say phone and, 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 and email and, or um, direct mail, but he was like social media. I'm like, you hmm. know, interesting how that has had a new effect, I guess, because just nobody is either touching mail or they just want everything online. What have you seen now is working for you in your business, like the cold call? I think the biggest thing, and this is a principle that cuts across all the different marketing media. So it works for like direct mail, pay-per-click, Facebook ads, cold calling. I think the biggest thing that people don't realize is the money's in the follow-up. So for me, on average, it takes 10 touch points to get a deal. So 10 pieces of follow-up to get a deal from the cold calling. And a lot of folks overlook that. They think like someone calls in for a direct mail piece or someone calls in from a, an ad and like, okay, they're ready to sell that day. Like, okay, they're motivated. They'll, they'll take my offer that day. Okay, move on. And that's not always the case. I've gotten a lot of my deals from the follow-up and follow-up can be like, you check in after a couple of days with a text or you check in like a week later with a phone call or you leave them a voicemail or if you have their email, you shoot them an email, but it takes, you know, 10 pieces of follow-up to get a deal. And it's not, okay, I got the lead, let's say December 1st, and I have the contract signed December 2nd. For me, it's typically about 30 days out. So it's like, get the lead December 1st, get under contract January 1st as a, as a rough example. So it takes time to like warm them up and build that relationship and actually get them to sign. It's not like they're, they're going to accept your offer right off the bat. And they're like, oh, okay, great. You know, I, I, yeah. They're motivated, but I haven't seen it happens, but it's not always the case that they're that motivated. So it takes that follow up and relationship building for sure. Oh, for sure. I mean, you know, it, it, nobody opens up that fast, but and and that's also a question I have on its own with with building that relationship, but it's amazing. I even had Justin Cromarty, he's an investor down in the South Florida Broward area, mm-hmm. and Justin is like really good at like the mail, the mail, the mail again, again, again. So like you just said, it's like that 10 point system, you just got to keep being, you got to follow up. Like I'm big on following up period. But like, like you said, follow up is big. Follow up is something you have to do. If you're not doing it, then you're going to lose out on the deal with the sellers or, you know, they may just think, Oh, this, this is just a fly by night deal. Right. And so, and, and then, and then most importantly, great. Um, the, see, I'm following you on this because now that you get your marketing piece and then they contact you, how are you like, what is the Victor secret sauce of, of building trust with some of these sellers or, you know, or finding that creative solution or problem solving for those sellers? What's that deal? I don't know if there's a real secret sauce at this, at the, you know, to, to sound maybe cheesy, like be yourself, be authentic. Don't, you know, just, just talk to them and see if you can help them out. Uh, I don't know if there's necessarily a secret sauce. You just talk to them. Hey, you know, why are you looking to sell? When are you looking to sell? What's wrong with the property? What do you want for it? And you just talk to them and get to know them. And there's no magic line. There's no silver bullet phrase that, you know, gets them on board suddenly. It's just, just the basics of having a conversation and getting to know them. And I think what's interesting about myself is, Hey, this is the unique piece. Like I actually care about their success. So even if they go with somebody else or if they go a different direction, like I still want them to sell the property or to have some sort of good solution. So it's happened before where they decide to go a different route with it. And it's like, okay, cool. At least you're taken care of. At least you're uh, well-situated. 
um, and you've got this problem solved, you know, if, even if it's not through me. So I think that sort of perspective really helps. I wouldn't say, I don't know if there's a real secret sauce. You just, you know, maybe the follow-up. <laughs> I follow up consistently. But... I agree with you. I couldn't agree more. I think follow-up is probably how you get the deal when you follow up with people. And you know what? I, I've noticed even whether it's clients, whether it's just people in general, friends, family, whatever – when you follow up, it's almost like they're surprised you remembered them you know, <laughs> because people feel like everybody forgets everybody. But then when you follow up with them, they're like really shocked. Wow, you remembered me? I've had that multiple times. And I'm like, yeah, I, have, I got you on a sticky right here, you know? Mm -hmm. So you, yeah, I, I really like what you're saying with all the follow-up. And I agree, be authentic, you know, uh, uh, follow through. I even have that on my probate PowerPoint slide. I explained, you know, when you get to heirs, you know, it's not just like here, sign the contract, but you're, you're, you know, you're approaching it with a, this is me, this is what I offer. And, you know, I'm helpful. I'm out there. So if, if you had to pinpoint it, what would be one of the most important tips or tricks to locking the deal, to getting it solidified, the selling point, or what, it, what would that be for you in your business? Oh, good question. I'd say that the phrase time kills all deals is really applicable here. So if someone says yes, and they're like, yes, let's do this. Okay. Yes, I'm in. Yes. That's a price I'll accept. Now you need to get it signed right away. Or you need to get that deal locked up right away. It's happened to me a lot where I, I hesitate on that or like they say, oh, you know, I'm interested, but let's, I want to talk to someone first. I talk to a family member first and I call them the next day and like, oh, I've actually changed my mind. So getting it locked up ASAP is my biggest, biggest advice there. Again, time kills all deals. So it's even happened where they agree to terms and they need you to follow up within a month. That's happened to me too, where someone had a, they agreed to the terms, they're about to sign it. And then they had some sort of health scare or health uh, incident. And then you, I, we could follow up like every week until a month and they would feel a lot better. They're back to normal, but then they weren't interested anymore. Like something's changed. So as soon as you agree, two parties agree, then get it locked up, get it signed, get it moving. Right. Yeah. If you, you know, that's just, it's pretty much with clients and everything, as long as you get it moving and you're on top of it, you're communicating. Cause you know, in, in, in some things I've seen, a lot of it comes down to basics, right? Communication, patience, uh, you know, just being there for people and, and explaining things because not everybody sees it from the perspective you see it. And so it really boils down to personalities and, and just people, you know, at the end of the day, it just comes down to that. So great tip for anybody out there watching. And so when you get that deal, you're getting to closing and maybe it's not the closing, but and, and, and if your answer here is probate, we'll dive into probate, but yeah, we'll, we're going to dive in at some point. Cause I'm sure Victor's got a crazy story he was telling me about and, and we'll dive in, but if probate's the answer here, just let me know. We'll dive in. But what is one of the biggest deal killers that you find in your business? I get answers, different ones all the time. It's like appraisal. The sellers won't let us in. The tenants are, are just dragging everybody. The title's messed up. The judgments are 300000 over the contract price. The title's crazy. There's five probates. There's two probates. There's It's just crazy. A tax deed tomorrow. What is that biggest deal killer for you, Victor? Mm -hmm. The biggest deal killer, I think, what would be the big, biggest deal killer? I'd say it's something like, I don't know if it's cold feet or it's something where they're interested at first and then they're, yes, they're ready to go, but then something happens and something changes over time. And it's not like they've solved their problem. It's just more of like a continuation of their problem, but they've just come to, you know, deal with it. So that's happened quite a bit. So it's not like a real sense of urgency. I guess they have a house they need to sell and need to get rid of, but there's no like real sense of urgency behind it. Um, and that's part of your, your job to, to like explain to them why it's urgent. Like how much money are they spending on this place per month with a mortgage and property tax and property insurance? Like why should they sell it now and release some of those funds and get some of those funds into their pocket as cash versus tied up into this property? So, so that's part of it. So I think it's just... I just want to tie it back to the, the time kills all deals. So I think that's really what it is, where just time kills the deals. You need to get it done, get it done quick. Any problems you run into, for the most part, are solvable. I just have to work through a creative solution or work together to figure it out. 
I think the time aspect, you know, if you get a deal, get it closed ASAP, don't, don't mess about. Yeah. I think the answer is just, it, it really depends on every investor and every situation. Mm -hmm. Like I'll get a title company on and they will be like the appraisal. And I'm like, you know, where did that come from? Or, you know, cause I don't see that in my day. If you, if you ask me that question, I would say just probably the timing on the closing or, you know, the underwriter finding all these things that didn't have to happen. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, now everybody's like, what's this, what's that, you know, too many people on title. Now we all don't agree. Now we're off. It's so, you know, your answer is great. I mean, cold feet timing, it all plays a role into somebody getting a deal or not. But the flip side to all of this, talk about flipping and flip flip side to all of this is when you don't have to deal with this, now you're looking directly at the wholesalers and saying, Hey, what deals do you got off market? You know, what, what, what's things are out there. So, you know, talk to those uh, wholesalers out there that, you know, you may be looking for that can help on the deals. You work with people on the wholesale or on the flip side, but you're getting them off market. Exactly. And I think the other thing to look at how I deal with wholesalers, which is a little bit unique, I try to build a relationship. So it's not like this transactional thing. Uh, Cause when I started, my first two deals were wholesale deals. And my first one I made about 3000, second one made about three and a half thousand. And with wholesaling, I never liked for me, for myself, so this is why I've been flipping. I never liked being negotiated twice. So it was negotiate with the seller, motivate seller. Okay. Get a good deal. And then they negotiate with a, a cash buyer, an investor. They want a good deal too. So they're going to beat you up on price. Uh, so I never liked that. So that's why I treat wholesalers a little bit differently. I, I just give them my highest and best right off the bat. And like, hey, this is where I'm at. This is why I'm there. I explain it in depth. And it's more about the relationship because if they're a good wholesaler, they're going to continuously get deals. And it might not be this one. It might be another one. But that, that's how I look at it, which is pretty unique. So just try to build a relationship, not try to like, oh, I got this great deal. I beat this wholesaler up and I made an extra, you know, couple grand. I'd rather, you know, get two deals off the wholesaler and make, let's say, 25K net profit each than just get one deal and make, let's say, 30K net profit. Right. Yeah. There's, there's always a solution to that, but yeah, building the relationships, the biggest thing in any part of the business. So that's, that's fascinating. So anybody out there watching you're in the Gainesville market, Alachua and Hey, you know, you never know, Victor may start spreading into <laughs> Baker and uh, Marion, you know, start spreading, but anybody out there that's, you know, either wholesaling the deal or just looking to connect with Victor relationship wise, you got to connect with him. So Victor, we couldn't get off the show without talking about probate. Yeah, sure. Tell us about your experience in the probate realm. And, you know, if you have those stories you want to share, you know, let us know, because I, I think a lot of investors, wherever you're at in real estate period, they've always heard, you know, probate takes forever. It's all, it's, it's long. It's, it's crazy. We can't, we can't close until it's all the way over. It's crazy stuff. But tell us about the Victor experience. I, I hate to burst your bubble. It's been actually a similar experience where it takes time and like they're good deals. Don't get me wrong, but you just have to wait a little bit longer. And especially when you're doing volume like myself, if a deal takes a little bit longer, it's not that big of an issue. It's like, oh, okay, I'll wait an extra month. Not a big deal. If you're doing, you know, one deal a year, then if it gets delayed and it's a probate issue, then you're going to, you know, not be a fan of probate. I do like probate deals just because they're even, even further off market. Cause we talked about off market. That's the best place to get deals. The more off the beaten path you get, the better. So I see probate as a really great way to get off the beaten path. Nobody really goes after it. Nobody really, you know, focuses on it. And the people who do do really great. Uh, so my experience with probate has been great. If you just deal with the time factor and know someone who's really good with probate, like, you know, attorney or, you know, someone who knows how to deal with probate, uh, specializes in it, then it's, it's awesome. It's a great source of deals. And then I know people, I don't do it personally, but I know wholesalers here locally who they focus on that niche and then they change their marketing. They change everything to, to focus on that. Uh, like, Hey, do you have a property that you've inherited that you want to get rid of? So they change their marketing. They, they see a ton of success. They know it's going to take a little bit longer. There's some more, more steps, but they know they're going to get bigger spreads, get bigger deals. Um, and it's worth it. And especially in today's market, because it is low inventory, uh, you got to like do a niche or you got to like have some sort of spin or you got to like re reorient to get the deals just because it's, it's low inventory. Everything's competitive. It's harder to get a deal now than before. So you can't really see inside my head, but I have like my brains going like this because I'm thinking of so many things with the probate world, whether it's big margins, big margins. I mean, it could be yeah. 50 to a hundred thousand, who knows? 
or whether it's just the deal itself that ends up being just really fruitful for you on, on, on timing and, and dealing with the probate. What are some challenges though, for you on that? Like what would make it better? What would make it a different experience? If it, if like the timing wasn't a problem, what, what would, what would you tackle them more? Like, what would you do if, if some of those snags weren't an issue? Yeah, sure. I'd be open to do more probate. Like right now I have two under contract of the, I have three under contract to buy, but two of which are probate and they're just taking a little bit longer and you know, and that happens. So the first one is that actually a probate and a foreclosure. So as soon as probate gets done, we got to deal with the bank and, you know, try to figure that out, which I'm sure we'll figure out. That's not a big deal. And then the second one is also probate and that's just taking a little bit longer. For the first one, we've been trying to do that one. I think we got it under contract in like early November and it's been like 45 days. It's been almost two months and we're still working through it. Then the second one we've had under contract for a couple of weeks and we're still just waiting on it. But that's the biggest thing. If we can find a way to, to work it quicker and get it knocked out, then I think probate's a great way to go. And then it's the, the trust in the process. As you know, there's these some niches that it's helpful to really know what you're doing and be knowledgeable or have someone who is knowledgeable. So for example, like short sale, like how do you handle a short sale? I don't know. I've never done it before, but if you're comfortable with that, and you know how to deal with it. That's a great niche. Same with probate. Like how is the probate process? How long does it take? What does it mean? How do I sell it? How do I market it? And there's a lot of questions with it. But if you have someone experienced like yourself who can like guide you through the process and explain like, Hey, this is how you do it. Then it's, you know, it's a great niche. There's so many routes you can go in the probate world. It's, it's really interesting. It's fascinating. And it, it's great hearing it from your perspective. So would, would you say like of all the deals that you do, would you say the probate's the craziest deals? Like what, what's been the craziest, wildest, weirdest deal that you have that, you know, maybe it's the tenant stuff that I saw you talk about. I don't know what it, what it is, but like, what is that deal to you? What's that story that's just so crazy? Yeah. So this one was a tax delinquent one. So he was laid on his taxes quite a bit and he was uh, he was a character to say the least. This one came from a wholesaler tax delinquent. He, he got it, marketed it. He, he had me see it just so I can, you know, see the place and see if I was interested. I was interested, but he, the, the wholesaler ended up paying. It was, he was going to lose the house on Tuesday if he didn't pay the taxes. So the wholesaler stepped up and paid the taxes on Monday. So he saved it. And that gave us some time to close because he got it. It was something like he got the piece of mail on Friday. He called on Saturday and the wholesaler was there Sunday. So there really wasn't time to like do a full closing or do anything like that. So that was the, that was the first part of that story. So I saved it right from tax delinquency. The guy almost lost the house. Eventually went through the process of like closing. That took a while because this guy just wasn't responsive. He just he just wasn't responsive. So I ended up having to work through the family, through the mom to get everything done. And then like the closing day showed, signed, came up and the seller was nowhere to be found. And eventually the wholesaler got him out and he was like drunk or high or something and got him to sign or I don't know what was going on with him, but I got it and it happened, which was awesome. And then the story continues because there's more. So we gave him 30 days to get his stuff out because the place was full of stuff. And he's like, I have all these power tools. I have all this stuff in the house that I want to keep and I just don't have time. You know, I'll, I'll get it out, but I just need more time. We're like, okay, let's just close on this thing and then we'll give him time. That was the only time we didn't do a post-closing occupancy agreement because part of it for the people who are newer to this, whenever you're giving people time to move out or you're, you're giving them some sort of additional time to move their stuff or, you know, whatever, there's a post occupancy agreement saying like, Hey, you need to be out within this time or there's this penalty, but you get it in writing. You can't just do it, just do a verbal agreement so that, that bit us in the butt. So he was supposed to get his stuff out within 30 days. It took much longer than that. It took like a couple of months and we kept on pestering him. Like, you got to get your stuff out, got to get your stuff out. And he would keep pushing it off. He was like, Oh, give me till next week. And I'll, I'll have made progress. And I showed up next week and it was like the same mess, same hoarder house. And we had people going there to do work. Cause like for the exterior stuff, like the roof, we could fix like some tree trimming we could fix. And for one of them, the seller was just hanging out because the house was here. And then in the back, like right across the street, 
was his mom's house and he lived in his mom's house, I oh, guess, wow. temporarily. So he would still hang out at the property and he would like badger workers and really annoy them. And one of the times the workers just had enough and pulled a gun on him because he was being like inside of the house, causing problems, like n- not making threats, but like almost to that level. We're just being aggressive. Like, hey, you guys need to get out of here. I have some valuable stuff. You can't work here. This is still my house. For some reason, he was still under the impression he never sold it, even though we showed him the closing papers. And so like, we sold this. You sold this to us a while back. And then he wasn't, he was like, oh, I should have never sold this place to you guys. He, he totally forgot about the tax delinquency and the fact that he almost lost it. So eventually got him out. There was a, a brief time, maybe a month, he went to jail. So he wasn't bothering us. So we tried to get as much work done as we could. <laughs> and uh put the lamps on guys we're gonna keep going right now it's 2 a.m go pretty much pretty much he eventually uh calmed down we i did a police report in the end and i think that kind of calmed him down or he stopped you know battering us as much it it was a flip property so he eventually sold it and we're out of it but that was that was probably the craziest thing it's not just like dealing with the seller up to the closing it was like dealing with him constantly and part of it was they lived so close. You know, if he was on the other side of town, that's totally you know, something totally different. And that'd be less of a concern. But the fact that it was right next door and had these sorts of personal problems, like I don't know if it was drug problems or alcoholism or something, he had something going on in his life that he couldn't think clearly. And that was that was apparent in his dealings with us. Like he'd sometimes forget stuff or forget that he sold the property to us. And that was that was an experience to say the least. <laughs> one of my craziest one. Well, it's 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 one of those moments for you that you'll never forget. Yeah. And I've then it, yeah, and then it's crazy because you're telling me that about how like you're showing him the closing statement. It's like you're like, wait a second. At that point, you're a trespasser. Like you shouldn't even be here right now. Like mm-hmm. you are not allowed to be here. We are now the owners and. That's crazy, Victor. And that's crazy. You got it from the tax delinquent sales. It's almost like going back on a marketing strategy. Tax delinquencies, if people don't know, they're those leads that there's a tax deed sale that's about to occur. And there's nothing that can stop that sale unless taxes, back taxes are paid plus the interest back to the tax certificate holder. It's a whole other topic, but basically it's just a call to action, you know, that, Hey, your property's going up for auction. You're going to lose it, you know, Hey, with this company. So that, that's a fascinating story for people that are out there that, yeah, I, I've heard, I've heard a lot this year in 2020 based on all the probates and stuff, but it's, it's amazing. Hey, Victor, you know, we, you, you let everybody know about your mentorship program. Like I said, backstage, we talked about how, you know, you're excited to be teaching and educating and showing and growing because you like that relationship building. You like helping others. And the fact uh, that you are in this Florida market is huge for anybody that's coming into Florida or it's interested and new. Tell everybody about your mentorship program. If they're interested, how can they get involved? How can they get in contact with you? Oh, for sure. And so what I do, I I flip houses, but I also teach people how to flip houses and I mentor folks nationwide. So I have folks in North Carolina, Michigan, you know, all over Oregon, all over the place. It doesn't have to just be Florida, but I do work with a lot of folks in Florida. Uh, So basically what it's, it's a mentorship program. I, I guide you every, every step of the way to get to your first flip. Or if you're already doing flips, like how to get you to six figures consistently, I basically teach what I do. And obviously what I'm doing is working because I'm out there, you know, doing this and I've learned a lot, a lot. And I just want to impart some of that knowledge onto some of the people with regards to getting started. Cause I know how it was when you're getting started. Like you don't know where to start. You don't know what to do. You're just kind of lost. And then you're like, you just end up procrastinating and it's months and months or years and years before you actually do anything or take any action. So the best way to get a hold of me, I'm on Facebook, which is my first and last name. If you look me up, I luckily have a pretty unique name. So if you look up my name, I'm one of the few people, especially in real estate. So just look me up and on Facebook is the best way. Shoot me a message. I'm, I'm here to help. Uh, but that's how I do the mentorship. I've had a lot of success with it. It's a lot of fun. I do want to mention that. So for me, for example, to go from 20 flips to 21 flips in a year, like, okay, cool. That's, okay, that's awesome. Right. I wouldn't turn it down. But for me to get someone from zero to their first flip, like that makes my whole week. That's like awesome, great, exciting. So it's more, it's more impactful. It's more exciting to also teach people. Don't get me wrong. I want to do more flips myself, but it's also more, just more enjoyable to teach others how to do it as well. 
Right. And you're, you're teaching them how to find, how they can find their style, their signature blueprint to what they do, which again, I didn't even think about it before I got on, but it, to me, it looks like art, which is amazing. And it's a, it's a style that you, you choose and pick, but anybody out there looking to get more of that info, you definitely find Victor on Facebook. I mean, I see his content get posted all the time. I'm even like, what, wait, what is this? You know, really interesting stuff. And he's been doing videos, posting content out there, bringing on people that are really cool. So, you know, Victor, if, if there's anybody looking to connect with you and you want them to connect with you, who are they? You know, let them know right now. For sure. So I work with a lot of what I call like real estate newbies or real estate beginners. So if you're out there, you know, flipping a hundred houses per year, you know, that's, that's probably not my, I can't really help you there, but I help folks who are just getting started or maybe they've done a few flips, but nothing consistently. I also want to mention, like, I think flipping is a really good strategy a lot of people want to build passive income and that's awesome. How I see it is it's best to do like the following patterns and do a flip, do a rental and do a flip, do a rental. And that way, every time you do a flip, you're generating cash. You could use that into your rentals as a down payment or to help get kickstart on the rentals. If you do it the opposite way, like you do a rental first, you have all your money tied up. So now you got to save and then have the cash flow. And it might take years before you can do your next deal. But if you do the sequence I prescribe, flip, rental, flip, rental, you just keep going and buy infinite rental properties. So anybody who I work with is basically real estate beginners nationwide, looking to get their first flip done, looking to get multiple flips done, get to six figures. And that's really who I help. Awesome, Victor. Hey, thanks again for coming on. Love, love talking to you about this stuff. You're a big flipping deal in Gainesville. And I, and I truly enjoyed hearing your side of all of this. And again, thank you for taking the time out of your day to help everybody hear your journey, the basics, how you dive in, and some of these crazy stories where you're diving into all these probate worlds and mm -hmm. it's, it's just crazy out there. And, you know, the more experience you have, the more you can share with everybody. So thank you again for coming on and we're going to make sure that you have this content and it's out there for you because it's, it's valuable for those out there. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me on. And hopefully what we've been talking about is valuable. And, you know, anybody wanting to get interested in flipping, talk to me. If you want to get started with probate, talk to Al. You know, probate's a great niche. I just, I want to mention that too. It's, it's a great niche and there's a lot of potential opportunity there for sure. Again, Victor, thanks again, man. Really appreciate it. We'll do it again sometime. We'll make sure part two, you may have some story. Even after we uh, drop off this, like two days from now, you're going to be saying, wait a second, I got to tell Al about this story. That was crazy. We got to talk about that next time. So thanks again, Victor. Thanks so much. Talk soon. All right, everybody, if you want more content like this, make sure you check out the Al Nicoletti YouTube channel. I've got content on the probates, the quiet titles, partitions, real estate matters. And of course, I'm going to have Victor's podcast on the show. And we're going to talk, we talked about a whole bunch of stuff. So it's going to be posted there, but there's going to be other podcasts with other special guests. So make sure you check out the Al Nicoletti YouTube channel. And I will see you next time on the Al Nicoletti show. Take care.